A while back, I received the following comment on my Q1 wrap-up video. You need to decide if you are rating on literary relevance or enjoyment. Seems like you are afraid to put stuff above objectively better novels when you enjoyed them much more. I personally don't care about objectively better. Let me know which you enjoyed more. 95% of everyone reads for enjoyment and not to dive deep into the nuances of what is the best literature. And if you are one of those, that's fine. You just need to pick one of those sides and not try to sit the fence between the two. It doesn't really work. You know what? I appreciated this comment, and I want to take a little bit of time to address these points. I think this comment must be specifically referring to my tier ranking of Don Quixote. Here's the thing. I absolutely loved the first half of Don Quixote. Part one was a funny and fantastical romp through the adventures of our endearingly delusional knight errant and his loyal to a fault squire. And it was written with the finesse and passion of an author at the peak of his creativity. But part two just did not resonate with me the same way. It was far more serious and cynical, and it felt to me like it was written by an author with an axe to grind. Cervantes seemed to shift his focus from the quirky charm of Don Quixote's misguided quests to a more somber reflection on the consequences of idealism clashing with reality. This almost complete tonal shift, while intellectually stimulating and undeniably crafted with incredible skill, stripped away the whimsy that I loved so much about the first part, making the second part much less enjoyable for me. And I get that I am somewhat in the minority here. Everywhere I look, I see people praising part two as the superior half. Despite these misgivings, I still rated Don Quixote incredibly highly. I placed it in my loved it tier. And I think this may be a perfect example of the dichotomy between a work's literary merit and the sense of personal enjoyment it offers, and how it is terribly difficult for someone who cares about literary merit to completely divorce their enjoyment of a work from said work's overall contribution to literature. So I am going to attempt to explain why I believe that literary significance and personal enjoyment can sometimes exist independently and how we can appreciate a work's import even if we don't enjoy every part of it. So when I refer to literary significance, I am specifically referring to a work's contribution to the broader landscape of literature. This includes its influence on future writers, the way it introduced new ideas or styles, its reflection of the culture, the politics, or the philosophies of its time. Books that are deemed literarily significant often do more than just tell a great story. They provoke thought, they challenge norms, they push the boundaries of what literature can achieve. Works like James Joyce's Ulysses, for example, are hailed for their groundbreaking narrative techniques and deep psychological insights, even though many readers find the book's dense prose and complex structure difficult to enjoy on a personal level. Now, a work's literary merit might also lie in its exploration of complex themes or its ability to innovate within a particular genre. Shakespeare's Hamlet is not just a tragic tale of revenge, right? It's a meditation on existentialism, on human frailty and the ambiguities of action versus inaction. Similarly, Don Quixote is celebrated not just for its narrative, but for how it deconstructs and parodies the concept of the heroic knight, offering a glimpse of postmodernism centuries before the term even existed. Essentially, literary significance involves a work's ability to transcend its immediate story and offer something more to the reader. 
a deeper reflection of human nature, a critical engagement with societal issues, an innovation in form or technique. But intellectually appreciating these qualities doesn't necessarily correlate with enjoying them. Personal enjoyment is far more subjective. It's about how a particular book resonates with an individual on an emotional, visceral level. Enjoyment can stem from many factors, right? Relatable characters, an engaging plot, beautiful prose, even a feeling of nostalgia that a book evokes. It's why some readers may find joy in reading epic fantasy like Lord of the Rings with imaginative realms and strange characters, while others might find joy in the introspective and psychological depth of authors like Marcel Proust or Virginia Woolf. A lot of my absolute favorite authors marry literary techniques with genre fiction like Borges and Calvino and even Ian Banks and Octavia Butler and Ursula Le Guin. Enjoyment of a book can also vary based on life experience, right? It can even vary based on your mood at the time you're trying to read it. For example, someone who is on a fast-paced thriller kick may not find nearly as much enjoyment in a slow burn, even if the slow burn is far more critically acclaimed than the fast-paced thriller. Likewise, a reader going through a difficult period in their life may not enjoy a book that mirrors their struggles, even though the book may be critically hailed as a profound exploration of hardship and suffering. Ultimately, personal enjoyment is about the immediate pleasure or satisfaction a reader derives from a book, and it's not necessarily linked to a book's intellectual merit or its contribution to literature as a whole. This is why a person may love reading a formulaic mystery but struggle to get through a dense classic. And this brings us to the central tension here. Literary significance and personal enjoyment, they don't always align. A reader might fully acknowledge a book's place in the literary canon, its innovations, its influence, its intellectual rigor, while not particularly enjoying the act of reading it. Conversely, a book that provides immense enjoyment may not have much in the way of literary merit, relying instead on well-worn tropes or simple storytelling techniques, characters you love or love to hate, universal themes, a satisfying payoff in the final act to something that was set up early on. Take, for example, once again, Don Quixote. The novel is divided into two parts with vastly different tones. Part one is whimsical and lighthearted, capturing the humor and absurdity of Don Quixote's delusions, while part two is darker and more reflective, focusing on the harsh consequences of Don Quixote's idealism. Some readers, like myself, may be at a place in their life to enjoy the playful tone of part one, but find part two less engaging due to its more serious nature, despite recognizing its intellectual depth. Some readers might feel the opposite. This is an example of how even within a single work, different sections may resonate differently with a reader's sense of enjoyment. There are numerous other examples of this dissonance. Moby Dick is often hailed as one of the greatest American novels, rich with symbolism and innovative narrative techniques. Yet many readers find it slow and difficult and bogged down by lengthy digressions on the minutiae of whaling. Moby Dick is one of my all-time favorite novels, and it took me some time to fully appreciate the encyclopedic whaling passages. And even though I definitely appreciate them now, I certainly understand why someone might not find it all that stimulating. Similarly, Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace is revered 
for its complexity, its wit, its deep philosophical musings. But its dense structure and nonlinear narrative, not to mention its girthy page count and its footnotes upon footnotes, can all be off-putting to readers who are seeking a more straightforward story. Again, Infinite Jest is among my favorite books of all time, but I'll be the first to admit that I would struggle to correctly order a list of events from the book's challenging narrative. So why do we still appreciate these works even when they don't provide immediate enjoyment? One reason is that literature, like any art form, isn't always meant to be easy or immediately gratifying. Some works challenge us to think in new ways, to confront uncomfortable truths, or to engage with complex ideas that aren't always enjoyable to grapple with. These books can leave a lasting impact, shaping the way we think about the world or ourselves, even if the process of reading them can be arduous. Many readers and critics place value on a book's broader cultural or intellectual significance. Even if a book isn't personally enjoyable, it might still be important because of the way it pushes the boundaries of the medium or the way it introduces new perspectives or serves as a springboard for future works. This is why books like The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner with its stream of consciousness narrative are celebrated for their innovation, even though they may not be universally beloved by casual readers. I had an extremely difficult time getting through House of Leaves with its ergodic passages and multiple author footnotes as it satirizes academia and intentionally frustrates the reader. But I can't help but respect the way it pushes the boundaries of the medium and toys with the idea of what a novel can be. For readers, the challenge lies in finding a balance between appreciating a work's literary significance and acknowledging the role personal enjoyment plays in their reading experience. I believe that it is possible and often necessary to hold space for both. A reader can recognize the brilliance of a doorstopper of a tome like War and Peace while admitting that they enjoyed a more straightforward, less complex novel like Project Hail Mary. A reader can love part one of Don Quixote, care less for part two, still give it five stars as a whole, and then admit that they had an overall better time reading red shirts. In fact, the ability to appreciate a book on multiple levels, both for its intellectual contributions and the pleasure it brings, separating and weighing those facets before bringing them back together can deeply enrich our reading experience. Rather than feeling forced to choose between literary merit and personal enjoyment, readers can embrace this duality, allowing each book to offer what it does best. Literary significance and personal enjoyment are two distinct but not mutually exclusive aspects of the reading experience. While some books do succeed in offering both, others excel in one area while falling short in the other. The beauty of literature lies in the fact that both have their place. After all, the true power of a story isn't whether it succeeds on every single level. It's whether it leaves a lasting impact. And that's what really matters. Thanks for watching. <laughs>